So, I started in this business in 1989, so I've been doing this for a long time. I'm in my 32nd year. Check the math on that, okay? All right? If you do this business for your whole life, if you dedicate yourself to it, every day looking for real estate deals, every day, just get up and want to find another one, another one, another one, right? You're going to have a lot of fun. You're going to make a lot of money. But something even better than all that's going to happen. What's going to happen to you is you're going to find a deal of a lifetime. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to find two of them. I think I got three of them so far, but tonight I'm just going to tell you about two of them. So I call this presentation deals of a, Two Deals of a Lifetime in Only Half a Life. That's right. Don't give me that look. I'm only halfway through life. I got a lot more deals of a lifetime coming through. So this is a picture of uh, me wearing a I Buy Houses t-shirt with an I Buy Houses car with an I Buy Houses truck in front of an I Buy Houses store. You don't have to wonder what I do for a living. That's one of the ways you find deals almost every day. Scream to the world, you buy houses. If you don't let people know what you do, how the hell are they going to give you the leads? Right? It's your job to let them know. I one time bought 10 of these t-shirts at $16 a piece, and I wore them until they were disintegrating. It took about nine months. I did not get a deal from wearing those t-shirts every single day for nine months. But I'll tell you something. I go to LA Fitness Gym. No one talks to you there because they all got earbuds in, right? So nobody's talking to each other. And the only, so when they're lifting weights, they're wearing earbuds. When you're playing basketball, I can't really go like while I'm covering a guy. Hey, what do you do for a living? You know, that doesn't work, right? So you try to talk to people whenever you can. But I can guarantee you this. Hundreds of people at that gym know what business I'm in now because I wore them stupid t-shirts for nine months, okay? Scream to the world what you do. All right, let's get on with one of the deals of a lifetime. This is an office building called Executech Suites. The address is 67 Buck Road. It's in Huntington Valley. I don't know if any of you have driven past this building. It's right near Beat Street. A lot of people know what Beat Street is. You know, it's like a place where your kids might go to hang out and almost like in a bar atmosphere but without the booze. I'm sure they're bringing the booze hidden in their clothes. But uh, anyway, so I went and took my real estate classes here to learn how to be an agent. That's how I knew about this building. One day, I'm looking at the MLS, and, and there it is. This building is for sale for $2.3 million. I said, I know that building. I was in that building. I like that building. So I called the owner. I'm a realtor. I called the owner. I told him I want to come in and look at his building. Make a long story short, I negotiated the price down from $2.3 million to $2,150,000, okay? A minor reduction, nothing to be excited about, but that's what I talked them down to. And a funny thing happened. So the people who were selling this building had two, not one agent, but two agents representing them. And these guys were from a big shot firm in Philadelphia called Marcus and Millichap, and they're, they're big shots, you know? They're like the C.B. Richard Ellis. We're the big guys. They were charging the seller of this building $130,000 in commission to sell this building for them. I came walking in. Before I tell you what happens in this meeting, I spent three years prior to this meeting going around looking at commercial properties. Let's face it, you can't call up Harvard and go, hey, can I take a class on commercial real estate? Because the professors over there, they don't know a damn thing about it, right? So how do you learn it? Well, here's how I decided to learn it. I did something called call the signs. People said, call the signs. What the heck does that mean, Phil? Well, how many times do you drive by a commercial property and there's a big sign out front. It says for rent, for lease, for sale. Call them. Go inside. Start asking them some questions. So the first time I started calling the signs, I'd go into the meeting and the, 
And the realtor would say, this property has a cam of 12. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about, right? But I got him to explain it to me. And then the next building I'd go into, I'd go, <clears throat> Mr. Seller, what's your cam? <laughs> Still didn't know what I was talking about, but I was trying to sound good, you know? That's how I learned looking at commercial buildings by asking questions, by calling signs, right? I used to drive my wife nuts. Be like Friday afternoon, I said, uh, she goes, she's getting ready to go out to dinner. She goes, where are you going? Didn't I tell you? I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this $5 million building. She says, how the hell are we going to buy a $5 million building? I said, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm working on a plan, you know? And I went around for years just looking at these properties. And as you talk to these agents, these sellers, you, you, you know, you find a guy who's real pliable, who really wants to sell the building. And you can sit down and have a creative financing conversation with him. Hey, would you, would you ever consider carrying the paper? How much? How about all of it? No? How about half? You know, you, you just have conversations with people. So what happened to me in the three years prior to going to this building is I was developing my skill set for negotiation, okay, and, and pretending like I'm Mr. Cool, like I know what the heck I was doing, even though I had never really bought anything that was for sale. Where are you going? I'm just about to give you all this good stuff, and you're walking out on me? Get back there. <laughs> what, do you got to go to the gym? Huh? Yeah? You got to lift weights more? All right. Okay. All right. So when I sat in this meeting with these people, these two big shot realtors who were making $130,000 a year, these guys really screwed up, okay? I essentially said, okay, I'll buy the building for $2,150,000. These idiots, did I say that out loud? I think I did, yeah, I think I did. These idiots signed an agreement of sale with me for $2,150,000, locking up the building, not for one month or two months or three months, but four months. Four months they took a multi-million dollar asset off the table, no longer available for sale, signed a contract with me, and they never asked me one simple question. What they should have said is, Phil, you're an interesting guy. You seem like you know what the heck you're doing. Uh, you would, you would be required to give us $475,000 in cash in order to lock this building up. Please show me the money. These idiots never asked me. I walked home and I, I, I got the contract signed and I left. I went home and I said, they're going to call. They're going to call tomorrow. They're going to call next week. They never called. They let me lock up a building for $2.1 million. I had 10,000 bucks in the bank. 10,000 bucks. Now you're probably wondering how the hell would I buy a building with $10,000? I'm going to tell you right now how I did it. Okay. Whew. I'm already tired. <laughs> so, I go home, I don't know what the heck to do. So I didn't, I only had $10,000 in the bank, but what I did have was a bunch of houses, right? And I'm a real estate agent. So I went home, and I took like eight of my houses, and I put them all up for sale, right? All eight of them. It took me like the whole night listing all these properties for sale. And over the course of maybe the next five or six weeks, I got four of my properties under contract to sell. Doesn't mean they're sold. Just means I got them under contract to sell, right? And if I could sell all four of them, I would have roughly $400,000, okay? Very simple. I got a little bit lucky. All four of the deals went through. And not only that, but I was the realtor on the buying side, uh, not on the buying side, but on the selling side of all four of my houses. But two of the buyers didn't have representation by an agent, so I also was their agent. So I was making the real estate commission on top of it too. Okay? I pulled out of that deal roughly by selling those four houses, roughly 400 grand, okay? Roughly 400 grand. I'm still way short, right? I got 410,000. I need 475,000 to close this deal. So it occurs to me 
Let me flip to another picture. This is just a marketing piece for a postcard we sent around to find tenants for the office building. This is my building. You can see it's a big place. It's got 47 offices in it. It's in a, what we call an executive suite center. If you know what Regis is or WeWork, anybody know those places? Okay. Well, they, they got a cool business model. The only difference is they, they don't own the buildings. I, I, I didn't build this place. I bought it, right? But I own the building. So, and I've already got a million. I bought this building in 2006. So I already got a million dollars in equity in this building, right? So I'm like halfway home with this thing. So this, this property, my wife runs the whole thing. <coughs> I never even go there. If, if I do go there, no one there even knows me because I hardly ever go there because my wife runs the whole thing. Anyway, so I'm short money, right? Three months goes by and it occurs to me I've bought duplexes before. I've bought triplexes before. And I know that when you buy a property, you get the last month's rent and the security deposit. If you buy a building, if it's just a duplex, the landlord gets the first month's rent, but the last month's rent is supposed to go into an escrow account, and the security deposit goes into an escrow account. Now, whether or not it goes into an escrow account doesn't really matter, okay? By, by definition, yeah, there's laws that say you're supposed to put it in an escrow account. I've yet to meet anyone who went to jail for not putting the money in an escrow account. Just pay the people when, when you have to pay the buyer. Well, this building was, had a rent roll of 42000 bucks a month. That was the rent roll at the time I bought it in 2006. It occurred to me, huh, give me a copy of those leases. Started looking at those leases, started adding up all the numbers, all the security deposit, all the last month's rent. It was all written right there. Came out to $60,000 approximately, $60,000. Well, now I got $470,000, right? Now, <clears throat> I put up another five grand, and there was my $475,000. But it gets better than that. So what I did with these four houses... If I sold the house, when those four houses that I sold, I sold all four of them to four different buyers. But I never took the money. I did what's called a 1031 exchange, okay? So I don't know if you know anyone who's ever done this. I frankly don't know anyone else who's done multiple uh, properties into one property. Uh, but I did it. They, they let me do it. So what you have to do is you hire someone called a 1031 exchange intermediary, and you are not allowed to touch the money. So I sold building number one. The money went right into a lawyer's bank account, which scared the heck out of me, okay, because I don't trust lawyers. Any lawyers in here? Yo, you're a lawyer? Okay, I trust you, but nobody else. All right, so this is what I did with four houses, all right? Four 1031 exchanges, the money goes into a lawyer's bank account called an intermediary, a 1031 exchange intermediary, and then at settlement, the lawyer wires the money to the settlement company. I cannot touch the money. If I touch the money, now I have to pay taxes on it. So if you want to sell a building, right, or four buildings, and buy one big building, this is how you do it, okay? Imagine that you could do that. What really happened? Here's a cool way to think about it. The money just changed addresses. It was secured against one, two, three. One of them was in Parkwood on Morning Glory Circle. You know that road, Bill? You're from Parkwood, right? Morning Glory Circle, it was called, right? I, the money now is in 67 Buck Road. I just moved the addresses of the money and paid no taxes, okay? So if you want to do something big one day, like Brian, I see he's listening to me. He didn't like Larry, but he likes me a lot better, right? Right? I used, I used to know your dad when he was your age, <laughs> right? So <clears throat> this is just, this is how you do it. You want to buy a big building, buy a bunch of houses first. A bunch of houses, keep them in your portfolio for 10 years. And those houses, all 10 of your houses go up by 
$60,000 bucks a year, you got $600,000, right? You can sell all 10 of those houses. You use the $600,000 as a down payment to buy a $4 million building, all right? You see how this game works? It's like playing Monopoly, isn't it? What do you do in Monopoly? You take greenhouses, you trade them in for a red hotel. Well, let me tell you something. Out of the four houses I sold, one of them had a green garage door, one of them had green shutters, and tell me that building ain't red. <laughs> tell me it isn't. It's red, man. It's a red hotel, okay? I'm playing Monopoly for real, okay? For real. My mother used to play Monopoly with me before the age of 10. I always wanted to play money, uh, games about money. My mom was an entrepreneur, taught me everything I know about business, made me be the banker, which also made me, you know, tempted to cheat. Uh, but we used to make up our own rules, okay? So I would say, hey, mom, you know, you don't have to go around the block three times before you buy a property in real life. Let's ditch that rule, right? So we made up our own rules, but it was a great way to learn about real estate and about money. So uh, this is my daughter. She runs the front desk. She really runs the whole building. But uh, we don't want to say that in front of her because then she'll ask for a raise. <laughs> this is the front desk. This is one of our conference rooms. This is our kitchen. Okay? So I ended up buying this building. It was by far the biggest property I ever purchased. If you think about this, at the time I bought this building, I wasn't probably even a millionaire yet. I was more like, had a net worth of maybe like 850, 900 grand, right? Half a million bucks of my, my net worth went into one deal. If this thing didn't work, I would have, I would have been like Larry with a shit ton of j -nog. <laughs> <laughs> Did I mention, I'm sorry Larry, I didn't mean to mention, I was just, just drawing a comparison. Right, right. And look, I lost my share of money too. So, you know, you're never going to, a real investor who buys houses, who trades stocks, who's out there taking chances, things are going to happen to you. You know, it builds character. That's the good news, if you believe that one. This is my wife in her office where she closes deals for anyone who comes in to look at the property. This is one of our biggest offices here. You know, it's about some of these offices can hold maybe like a dozen people as our biggest office, but we also have offices just for one person or really one of the things, the first thing we ask somebody is how many employees do you got? And we know exactly what kind of office that you need, right? We provide the furniture, the artwork, the telephones. So sometimes people will say, well, what do you get for $4.95 a month at Executech Suites? Well, let me tell you. You get an office big enough for one person. You get the furniture in that office. You get the telephone on the desk. You get the telephone numbers, right? You get the fax number. You get the internet, right? You get a mailbox. You get a printer, a copier, or scanner. You get two receptionists to answer the phone in the name of your company and patch the calls to you no matter where you are. You also get the utilities, the cleaning service, and free coffee <laughs> for $4.95 a month. That's how we rent our offices. It's just one flat price. Brian, when you're ready to open up your first business, you call me, man. Don't call Larry. Call me. All right. This is our mailbox area, our printer, our copier, our scanner. And I'm going to get to this next deal of a lifetime in a second. Just to show you, okay, this is just one deal. Think about this for a second. My mortgage payment on this building is $9,500 a month, okay? I think I've got nine years left on it. So in nine years, you want to talk about a retirement plan? I'm only 55, right? Right? I can hang with Andrew here. He ain't got nothing on me, right? My income stream goes up 120,000 bucks a year in nine years. That's just from one building. I own a lot of buildings. That's just one building. You see what you can do? Especially you young people, think about this. Buy some freaking buildings. Buy as many as you can buy. Buy one a year. Buy three a year. Buy as many as you can buy. Learn how to do what we teach here. And you can, it's almost impossible for you not to be rich. 
You could be a multimillionaire easy. I, this was a risky move for me, but it's paid off in spades. I don't even go there. Nobody even knows me there, and that's the way I like it. Because back when everybody knew me, I ran the building for the first couple of years, and then what happened was, man, I couldn't get nothing done. There's like a hundred people that work there, right? Every time I turn around, hey, Phil, hey, Phil, hey, Phil. You know, asking you business questions or just being friendly or playing poker with them or whatever it was. Couldn't get a damn thing done, right? N I, normally, I'm used to having residential tenants. You rented them once and you never see them again for five years, right? As long as they're paying the rent, you never see them again. All right, let's get to the next multiple deal of a lifetime. This is my other deal of a lifetime that I've put together. This one, I'm down in Siesta Key, hanging out with my wife and my mother-in-law. And my mother-in-law and I are pretty tight. She's a real estate investor most of her life. She's also a private investor, but she only lends to me, so don't even try it. I see you looking, Eric. Don't even think about it, okay? My mother-in-law says to me, I've been speaking to her. I know Larry knows her, but she, I, I put in a bad word for him. <laughs> so, my mother-in-law says to me, um, she has a grandson who grew up in Siesta Key, just coincidence. In the 80s, her and her husband used to travel to Siesta Key. And she says, Phil, I had a very romantic weekend in Siesta Key in 1980s. It was at a Best Western Hotel. Would you take me there? I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So I Googled. There were four Best Westerns in Siesta Key. So me and my wife and my mother-in-law were driving around. She goes, nope, this isn't the place. This isn't the place. This isn't the place. And this isn't the place. I'm like, oh, look, there's only four of them. I just took you to them all. So I'm getting a little frustrated. And I see a for sale by owner sign in front of a trailer home. Just a mobile home. Typical mobile home, right? So I drive over, take a picture of the sign, and uh, I call the guy the next morning. And he goes, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not selling the trailer home. I'm selling the whole mobile home park. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> see, sometimes it's better to be lucky than it is to be smart. Maybe somebody up there likes me, just good shit happens to me. I don't know. I'm not complaining, right? So, I call the guy. He turns out to be a professional comedian. His brother is Gallagher. For those of you who are old enough to know who Gallagher is, he is a professional comedian. He goes under the name Gallagher 2. I'm not kidding you. And he's funny as hell, too. He's just as funny as his brother, maybe even funnier. And uh, these guys were from Sarasota. I never, I never knew that Gallagher was from Sarasota until I bumped into his brother. Gallagher has a mobile home park look nothing like this picture I'm showing you now. This was a, this was a dirty, disgusting, crappy as can be mobile home park. The worst, right? So Gallagher, too, makes a deal with me. $917,000 to buy the park. He wants two hundred grand in cash, right? He's got a hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage. He wants to blow out. He wants fifty grand in his pocket. He's going to use the fifty grand to buy a Winnebago, and he's him and his wife are going to drive around the country for the next twenty years. His plan was, he said, "I'm sixty five years old, and I am going to he seller finance this park, right?" I pay him $5,200 a month. I have been paying him $5,200 a month since 2016 on Halloween, which is when I bought, that was the day I bought it. Don't ask me why, but I've bought multiple properties on Halloween. I don't, I don't understand that at all. But last day of the month kind of thing, you settle on the last day of the month, I don't know. So I buy this thing on Halloween in 2016. I've been paying him $5,200 a month for over four years now, or just about four years, he put in a rule, I am not allowed to pay him off early. If I sell the park and pay him off early, I have to pay a $45,000 penalty. I said, fine, deal. But he will allow me to substitute collateral. Substitute collateral means 
if I gave him another property as valuable or more valuable than this property as collateral, he would move the loan to that. But that's tricky, okay? Because if you did have another build, I do have other buildings like Executech, they're worth a couple million bucks, but it's not like there's no loan on them. There's a loan on everything, right? That's how we finance things in the real estate world. So Gallagher says, I'm 65 years old. I'm going to die when I'm 85. I need $5,200 a month so I can drive around the country for the next 20 years. So, well, uh, what happens if you don't die? <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's his problem, right? He's not asking for me to fund it anything past 20 years down the road. So I said, deal, let's do it. So where did I get to 200 grand? I borrowed it. I called up a private lender, gave me 200 grand, and wired me the money almost instantly. But I got, uh, back in the day when I was buying up Siesta Key, at one time I had 42 vacation rentals in Siesta Key, and I had a one private lender, just one guy, who lent me $3 million alone, just one guy. I borrowed money off of other people because I, I probably used about uh, 6 or $7 million worth of private money. I made a couple million bucks off the whole venture by the time I was done. But I owed one guy $3 million. I'm proud to say I don't owe him anything anymore. But um, he gave me the 200 grand to give to Gallagher. I gave it right to Gallagher, went to settlement, did the deal. And then uh, I'm going to pay Gallagher for the next, uh, what do I got left? 16 years. 16 more years. It's fine. I'm cool with it. Right? So this place, we, what we did, me and my business partner, is... We started throwing out all the crappy trailers. So it's a funny story. Gallagher 2 says, I'm going to need to write a letter to all the tenants to tell them that you're the new owner. I said, okay, well, go ahead. So he wrote a letter. He never, like, sent it to me to look at. He just sent it to the tenants. So the day the letter hits, I get all these phone calls. What are you going to do with this park? Are you going to kick me out of here? Are you, uh, wh wh what are you going to do? Guys, all these different people calling me freaking out, right? And I'm getting, like, probably got about seven, eight semi-nasty phone calls in one day. And then this guy calls me up, and he goes, Hey, man, what's up? Congratulations on buying this, uh, tiny, buying this mobile home park. He goes, Do you want me to tell you who all the uh, jerks are in this park? He goes, I said, uh, Yeah, okay. Let's tell me. He goes, Oh, the guy in park number three gets all drunk, and he pees right out his front door. The guy in lot number four, he tapes trash bags to the outside of his windows with duct tape. That's his blinds, okay? Oh, uh, the guy in number seven, he, he buys used cars, tears them apart, throws the car parts all around his trailer, right? So he's giving me this story. By the end of the phone call, I say, look, dude, uh, you want to be the manager? <laughs> I hired him. He's been working for me ever since. He's been working for me over four years now, or just about four years. So he managed this place, and what we did is we, we went in and we said, what's the crappiest-looking trailer in this whole place? That one and that one. Okay, in Florida, eviction notice, three-day notice. That's pretty brutal if you ask me, but I didn't kick them out in three days anyway. I just put the notice on their door and let them know, like, you need to get out of here in the next couple of months, Right. And uh, then what we did is we, we used some of our own money and we bought three brand new tiny homes. And we had them built, okay? And so that cost us roughly about 50000 apiece. So these tiny homes, you can see some of them in this picture here. I'll show you. Here's a, here's a better picture. You can see what some of them look like. These, this red one and this yellow one and this green one, they are replicas of the lifeguard stands that they have in Siesta Key. So we had these things built, right, by the Amish in Pennsylvania. And we put up our own money to get them built. When they were finished, a truck pulled them all the way down to Siesta Key, Florida, pulled them into the spot. No sooner did they get pulled into the spot, we brought private lenders in. And we said, come look at this cute little tiny house. Isn't that cute? Oh, this is so cute. Look at it, right? <laughs> would you lend me $45,000 for this? And people would lend $45,000 for each house. And guess what I'd get? I'd get my hundred fifty grand back, right? What'd I do? Buy three more homes. So this whole cycle took about three months. It took a year and a half 
to get rid of every crappy home in this park and fill it with all these cool-looking houses, right? Better yet, we wouldn't rent these to any one person. What we did was we rented them out as hotel rooms, 150 bucks a night. If you know anything about the mobile home park business, mobile homes and mobile home parks are some of the cheapest places to live on, the, in, on earth that I know of. Anywhere in America, you don't get any cheaper, okay? What's a typical apartment cost? What do you think, Andrew, a typical two-bedroom apartment costs you in any city in the United States? What, for the, for the month, right? An apartment building. It's an apartment building. Yeah, two-bedroom apartment. What's it cost? 1500 Okay, good guess, right? You can probably live in a mobile home park like this mobile home park before I bought it somewhere between $500 and $800 a month. There's nothing cheaper. And you got a single family home, uh, technically, and you're not attached to neighbors, and you don't have to listen to your neighbor's loud music or when he's fighting with his wife or him parking in your parking spot or any of that stuff because you're in a mobile home park. It really is. It's a single family home. Any way you slice it, it is. Okay? These are three of the really cool looking houses. This one's called the Margarita, the Green Lifeguard Stand, the Red One, Flamingo, the Sand Dollar. In, so Gallagher 2, when he sold this, I'll tell you something interesting about him. Gallagher 2, one of the first things he said to me is, I hate this place. I'm so sick and tired of coming here and collecting the rent. And he kept bitching about collecting the rent. Right? And I'm looking around and I'm like, it's a mobile home park, right? Yeah, 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 Phil. I said, yeah. the people own their own homes, right? He's like, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking to myself, if the people own their own homes, then you don't got to fix nothing. I didn't say that out loud to him. I'm sure he knows it. You don't got to fix nothing, right? So I'm thinking to myself, what the hell does he hate this place for? All the hell he's got to do is collect the rent and cut the grass. And in Florida, you know what you do if you need a, a guy to cut your grass in Florida? You go shake a tree and three people fall out of it to cut grass. Everybody cuts grass in Florida. You could go stand on a corner for one minute and five freaking landscapers will drive by. Just look at the phone number and call them. That's all you got to do, right? Everyone cuts grass in Florida. They don't even have grass in Florida. That's the funniest part. It's just weeds. It's not even grass, right? It's like just some concoction of, of whatever, right? The most money Gallagher made from this mobile home park was approximately $10,000 a month. When we finished changing every single house, we average over $50,000 a month in the winter months. I'm talking February and March. We make more money, okay, in those two months than he makes almost in the whole year. He was making 120 grand a year gross in a whole year. We made 100 grand just the month from February 1 to March 30th, right? Renting it out as a hotel. And the only reason we were allowed to do that was because it was a mobile home park and as the rules, according to the township, were as long as you have wheels on these houses, it's okay. You can rent them out nightly. So that's what we did. And uh, this park today, what's it worth? I don't know. I never paid anybody to appraise it. My guess would be about two million bucks, right? And I found it by accident. My, my, my mother-in-law was looking for a place where she had uh, multiple orgasms and wanted me to take her there. I mean, right? Funny how things work out, isn't it? You don't got to be a genius to be in this business. You got to wear t-shirts, wrap your car, tell everybody that this is what you do for a living. I promise you, if you do that, Andrew's already doing it. He wrapped his car. He's wearing t-shirts. He's not wearing it tonight, but he... You must have bought one T-shirt. You got to buy ten, right? Buy ten. Well, okay. One day, if you do that, I promise you, you are going to find a deal of a lifetime. Same thing for you, Brian. You can do it. Your dad is in this business. 
I've been in this business my whole life practically. I started when I was 23. Anyone can do it. You do not need to be a genius. If you're a member of this school and you have any kind of problem, we're here two nights a week. You have a problem? Come here and ask us. We'll fix it for you. We'll tell you how to get out of it. We'll give you the contract. We'll go with you if you're in a real pinch and you need our help. There's, so, n there's no place like this place, okay? I n have never been to a real estate meeting where the mentors are available to you two nights a week, all right? Multiple deals of a lifetime. If you want to read more about these deals, I wrote about them in these two books. Addicted to Real Estate was more of a book I wrote about the first 20 years of my investing career. How to Buy Houses with None of Your Own Money. Uh, a lot of the deals I did in Florida are all uh, detailed in this book. If you want to learn about how do I do creative financing? Obviously, you get all the education you want right here. But if, you want, if you're the kind of person that wants to know more details, 20 bucks gets you 20 years worth of education. So you can check these books out if you really want to know more. And I want you guys to know that I wasn't kidding around in that mirror. You do deserve it. You just got to make it happen. By doing what? Wrapping your car and wearing some silly t-shirts? Okay? Andrew's going to do it. Brian might. We'll see. Thanks for listening, guys.